Praise the Lord. It's good to be together. I tell you, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, uh, to uh, humbly come before the Lord like we just saw here in our, in our own presence. Uh, people coming as perhaps you are at home as well doing the same thing. You're just coming before the Lord to present yourself. We're standing with you as well. What a privilege it is. And I believe that God responds when he sees our humility and we come before him. You know what I mean? I think like God is opposed to the proud, the Bible says, but he gives grace to the humble. And when we come and say, Lord, I need you. <laughs> you know the situation, whether it's for yourself or someone you love. It's just, uh, it's just absolutely so cool to, uh, to see God at work and to hear the testimonies that come often later. We hear about the way the Lord is working. So uh, we are privileged to stand with you as your brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, just believe God with you for great and awesome things that, that he has the ability to do. Because some of our situations in life get so complicated, and sometimes it's our own choices that have made them complicated, but God can do beautiful, incredible things in, in our lives if we just stay figuratively and, and perhaps literally at the altar and just, Lord, we're yours. So... Looks like the kids are going to have a good time. I, I saw a tent down there. That looked kind of cool. And um, it was cool. Hey, I want to give thanks to the people that helped out this weekend with the lock-in. So I know Pastor Josh and, and several youth leaders were involved. Um, I heard Jesse came out. I know that people brought food and all kinds of things. You know, to pull off an event like that takes work. It takes a lot. And I, as a parent, I just want to say thank you to really everybody that was helping out. So thank you. I'm from me, but can we just give them a hand, everybody? Thank you. Awesome. Well, have you ever gone through a difficult situation in your life where at the end of it, it was as if God himself vindicated you with his blessing in dramatic fashion? Or perhaps you're in a situation right now where you, you haven't seen God's blessing in dramatic fashion yet, but you're in the middle of a situation where you're, you're going through something that is, you just would ask that he would somehow vindicate you with his blessing in dramatic fashion. Uh, we have some dear friends who are going through some difficult circumstances. We've been through things ourselves in our own past where uh, just difficulty and hardship and unfortunate events, uh, sometimes that are totally out of your own control, and, and yet God can show up and vindicate in a way that is just, it's almost as if he, he says, I've seen it, and I just give you this as a little blessing to let you know I'm with you, and I am for you, and I am leading you in the way that is good. And uh, we see that today in the Bible. We're looking at Jacob, uh, beginning in Genesis chapter 30, and we're looking at the blessing of the Lord upon his life. How after 20 years of hardship in serving Laban, God blesses him in dramatic fashion and he's getting ready to return uh, as he's getting ready to return to his homeland. We're going to look at Genesis 30 into chapter 31 a little bit and um, we're going to read the story of two men. One who walked by faith and one who walked by sight. And there's such a contrast that the Lord allows us to see here. That's uh, fantastic. I want to begin uh, by reading this uh, passage. We're going to begin in verse 25 here of chapter 30, and I'll read to the end of this chapter, and then uh, we'll comment about that, and then we'll get into the next section here. It says, As soon as Rachel had born Jacob, Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own home country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you that I may go, for you know the service I have given you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came and it has increased abundantly and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. 
If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look on into my wages with you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen." Laban said, good, let it be as you have said. But that day, Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in charge of his sons and set a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob and Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. Then Jacob took fresh stick sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks and the troughs, that is the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred where they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks. And so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped. And all the black in the flock of Laban, he put his own dro droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, Jacob would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks female servants, and male servants, and camels, and donkeys. Wow. Interesting portion of scripture, isn't it? So we see that once Joseph was born, we've uh, been studying Genesis, if you're new to us, and we're walking through, Pastor Josh and I have been sharing uh, different portions as we've come to them, and uh, we have seen uh, more recently Jacob and Leah and Rachel, there's a, there's a a wedding that happens there, and Jacob has now two wives who are sisters. Um, I'll speak a little bit about that uh, coming up, but, but for the most part, that's behind us. And now there is 12 children uh, between them. Uh, so they're including a daughter and 11 sons, and there will be a 12th son who doesn't come yet, but he's, he's coming later. Jacob uh, is at this point where he's 91 years old, and he's saying to his Laban, I've served you long enough, and I have served you well. It's time for me and for my wives and our children to leave and go to my homeland. Jacob arrived in Haran, this portion of uh, the world in the Middle East, about, around age 77. He worked seven years for Rachel, and, and when he was going to marry Rachel, on the wedding night, her father put the older sister Leah into the tent. And Jacob wakes up in the morning and he says, what is this that you have done to me, to Laban? And he says, well, in our country, this is how we do it. We, we let the older daughter marry first. Uh, so, but, but listen, you can marry Rachel. Just give it a week. I'll let you marry her too. But you have to work another seven years for Rachel. Right. What a raw deal. However, God was working, you see. So then at this point, these 14 years are completed. Jacob is now about 91 years old, and he wants to move on and take his wives and his 12 children with him, and he really doesn't want to go away empty-handed. He's worked very hard. Uh, Laban has been completely blessed here and prospered, so he, he's saying, I've made you prosper, but how and when shall I provide for my own household? So Jacob is frustrated because Laban was deceptive in his dealings with him. And chapter 31 uh, which we'll get to in a little bit, it tells us that Laban changed his wages 10 times. But here's the thing. Genesis chapter 12, and you have to go back to the kind of the beginning here where God speaks to Abraham. In verse uh, 2 and 3, one of the things that he says to Abraham is, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. See, Laban dealt with Jacob in a way that was completely dishonoring. So Laban gained considerable wealth over the 14 years that Jacob was working for him. Uh, and, and, and he himself is beginning to realize that. As much as Jacob doesn't want to go empty hand, away empty-handed, Laban really doesn't want Jacob to go because he knows that he's been blessed because of Jacob. But the truth is he doesn't want to admit that he's blessed because of Jacob. 
So he says, if I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Divination. Really? Now he's practicing or perhaps paying someone to practice divination. By the way, uh, just a short note on that. The Bible forbids, it doesn't happen here that it happened, but later in Scripture, the Bible forbids against the practice of divination, fortune telling, consulting mediums, palm readings, any other illegitimate means of trying to gain information other than seeking God himself and his word for revelation or through his prophets. Uh, one particular place where you read of this is uh, the story of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 28. Saul consults a medium because he wants to speak with Samuel, the prophet, who died previously. And, and this, as you read it, was one of the last things that he did uh, in his life. Uh, and and if, if you have ever done something like that, it just, it's a matter of confession and repentance. You see, you see for, Lord, I, I, I didn't know, or maybe I did know, but I just wanted my answer. And I practice this, and there's just a repentance and confession. And as we close, I'll lead, uh, and when we close in prayer, I'll lead us in that as well, that you can uh, begin to do that. Instead, seek God through prayer. Seek God through reading his word. The leading of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us as Christians. Sometimes God will answer us in a divine way. Other times he's silent. And that was part of why Samuel was tempted to do that in the first place, you see. But we in our impatience should never look for answers through any type of illegit illegitimate means. So back to divination, okay? So now personally, I, I think he's bluffing. This is just my personal take. I don't really hear other people saying that when I look at different commentaries. But this is why I believe that. And whether he practiced divination or not almost doesn't matter. If he did, that's fine. But I, I, he's, he's bluffing in this way. Um, he, the, he doesn't want to admit that he's blessed because of Jacob. So he has to say, well, it's been revealed to me by special revelation. You see, uh, anyone with eyes who could see can see that Laban was blessed since the day Jacob arrived. Even at the well where Jacob met Rachel, which we talked about a few weeks ago, it was obvious to her, it was obvious to the shepherds who were there, uh, that there was something special about Jacob. And now, 14 years, two wives, 12 grandchildren, and a multiplication of Laban's livestock later, it's plain for everyone to see. But Laban doesn't want to admit this to himself or to anyone else that he's been blessed because of Jacob. That's why I feel, <laughs> you know, whether he used divination or not, whatever, whatever the case may be, but the, this was baloney. It, the bottom line is it was a bunch of baloney. He didn't want to admit that this, he was blessed because of this man. That's why I say, yeah, right, okay. So we're kicking it up a level now, okay? Jacob's saying, look, I've worked hard for you, now it's time for me to provide for my own, my own family. Laban says, what shall I give you? But Jacob knows this man is a complete deceiver by this point, and he can't trust him. So he says, all I ask for is the spotted and the speckled sheep, the black lambs, essentially that which would have been considered to be less valuable to Laban and also could easily be identified later as the ones not belonging to Laban. So he couldn't be accused of stealing anything, you see? This agreement results in another six years of service for Laban. The first 14 for the wives. Now he's looking to take something home with him that can generate wealth for his family. And that's an important concept uh, because livestock are a tremendous way to generate wealth because they multiply. They multiply. And in that multiplication, wealth can be generated over time. So Laban agrees, but that day, as we see in verse 34 through 36, he removes the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted. Everyone that had white on it and every lamb that was black. What a crook this man was. Instead of saying, hey, you're my son-in-law. You have my two daughters. You have my 12 grandchildren. I want you to be blessed. He looks out for himself. You see? And he tries to put Jacob and consequently his daughters and grandchildren at a disadvantage while he seeks his own gain. It's truly sickening. Uh, when, you, when you look at the story, you can see it is truly sickening. The Bible says the love of money 
is a root of all kinds of evil. And Laban was infected with that disease. It's an important warning to us, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that as well, because that's another area of our life where we can get completely sidetracked and miss the good blessings that God has for us, those who walk in faith and by faith and not according to what they see with their eyes. So there's this sickness potentially in all of us that could, and Jesus warned, he said, you cannot serve God and mammon or money or wealth. Very important. So despite Laban's actions, the Lord blesses Jacob immensely, absolutely immensely. And he does so through unique circumstances with this specific method of peeling white streaks in the poplar, almond, and plane tree branches. Now, some believe it was possible that this could have provided a stimulant or, or something like that that made the live pro- livestock reproduce. And perhaps that was the case. There's no way to really prove that. But it's important to note here that this method is not scientifically reproducible. That, that's the thing you got to understand. It's not like if we did that today and said, okay, let's try that. Okay, let's do this. Here it is. Good. Come on over now. You feed. It's not like the same effect. You know how science is. You, these kids do it here all day. Uh, you, you try to do an experiment and you, you see, okay, we tried this. We got these results. Well, let's try it again and see if we get the same results. Let's try it again. Let's add this. Let's see what else happens. It wasn't a scientifically reproducible uh, occurrence here. But, but here's the thing. Uh, from the best we can see in reading chapter 31, which we'll get to shortly, God gave special revelation to Jacob in a dream through which he would prosper. And we see God's blessing increasing upon Jacob extraordinarily. But by mistreating Jacob, Laban is eventually disadvantaged himself. Remember Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you, and he who dishonors you, I will curse. And that wasn't just for Abraham, but that promise was for Abraham through his descendants, ultimately to us today who believe in Christ. God's blessing increases to the point that finally, in verse 43, we see that Jacob increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants, and camels and donkeys. It reminds me of his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham. In Genesis 13, it says, Now Abraham was very rich in livestock, silver, and in gold. And it tells about Isaac in Genesis 26. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. Now these men had their troubles, but the blessing of the Lord was upon them. It says the Lord blessed him and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. In fact, those who opposed him later said, we plainly see, this is to Isaac, that the Lord has been with you. Let's make a pact, a treaty, a peace treaty, that that you will not harm us as we have not harmed you, you see? And here at the end of chapter 30, we see similarly the blessing of the Lord is upon Jacob as it was upon Abraham and Isaac. Now, as we move into chapter 31, I won't uh, read it quite the way I did to you there from the Bible, but I'm going to essentially... Uh, quoted as I kind of talk here for a few moments. The first verse says this. Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying two different things here. Number one, Jacob has taken all that was our father's. And the second thing, from what was our father's, he's gained all this wealth. He's taken away all that was our father's. And from what was our father's, he has gained all this wealth. So Laban's sons are beginning to get concerned about their own inheritance. Well, what's going to be left for us? Because they could see as well what's happening. And Jacob saw, verse 2 says, that Laban did not regard him as before. And verse 3 says, then the Lord speaks to Jacob and says, return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred and I will be with you. Then in the next section here, of 31 verses 4 through 13 Jacob calls for a family meeting he says Leah Rachel let's let's talk 
and he states the facts about how their father Laban has mistreated him, but also says how the Lord has been with him and how God has intervened. And he says this, it is clear that your father does not regard me as with favor as he did before, but God has been with me. You see, so there's the negative, but God, you see, here's the positive. You know I served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. And again, here to God. God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. Then Jacob tells him how God spoke to him in a dream, saying to him, Jacob, I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise and go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, who you read about in chapter 28, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise and go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. And the girls, women, respond this way. Um... They say, is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? I mean, think of how sad that is. Their own father doesn't even regard them as his own daughters, but now they're like foreigners to him. It's so sad. For he has sold us. They use the word sold us. Treated them like property for his own advantage. And he has indeed devoured our money. In his greed, he squandered what should have been saved as a blessing for them. And in verse 16, they say, All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children, recognizing that it was God at work. Now then, to Jacob, they say, Whatever God has said to you, do. Laban was a man of whom it can be applied The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And if you trace his life and you can see it beginning in Genesis chapter 24, which was about 117 years prior to this event right here, you see that he was attracted to wealth. Uh, you, You saw it in the gifts that were given to his mother, uh, his sister, forgive me, uh, Rebecca, when Abraham's servant came and gave her bracelets and gave her a a ring. And then costly ornaments were given to him and to his mother. But somehow he was more enamored by those things. And he missed the whole point. And this wealth or this love or attraction for it ultimately was destroying him. It wasn't the wealth itself, but the love of the wealth. And it would cost him here his relationship with Jacob, his daughters, and his grandchildren. 1 Timothy 6 says this. Very important. I can't not mention this as we're here. 1 Timothy is in the New Testament. It's written thousands of years later. But it says this, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. You think of that statement. I remember the bumper stickers years ago uh, growing up on Long Island. He who dies with the most toys wins. You know, it doesn't work that way. He He who dies with the most toys wins nothing and dies and can't take his toys with him. You see? But, but if, verse 8 goes on to say in 1 Timothy 6, but if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It's not that the money is evil, it's that love of it, because it's never enough, you see? It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And that's where Laban was at, piercing himself with many pangs. And it's such a contrast between these two men, Jacob 
and Laban. Though there were similarities in that they were acting deceitfully and they were deceptive in different ways. But by this point in Jacob's life, we see that his diligence and his obedience combined with God's incredible blessing caused him to experience godly prosperity. While Laban was in a downward spiral. And it needs to be a warning to us that we can learn how to generate wealth as Jacob did without being consumed by the love of money as Laban was. And he lost everything or was losing that which was most precious. I want to uh, just begin to wrap this up here. What, what are we learning from this? First, I, I see that it's the blessing of God that makes us rich. We need to obey and we need to work hard, but it's God's blessing that makes all the difference. This isn't a formula necessarily as we read this chapter for prosperity, you see, but, but everyone's life is different. You see what I mean? Uh, but if you pray and you ask for God's blessing, if you obey him, And work hard. He just might bless you in ways that can bring him glory that you didn't even know existed. And by the way, when you obey, um, God might tell you to do something that no one has ever done before. And that's important. I think of entrepreneurs who are stepping out and they want to try something different. Uh, It can take radical obedience. I mean, well, it might look funny if I do that. I mean, how do you think he, Jacob, felt? Well, I'll just, uh, you know, peel the bark off of these. Okay, we have little stripes. I mean, we, we don't read about this elsewhere, right? This looked very strange. But he apparently saw something and, and responded to that in his encounter with the Lord. So radical obedience is important. Don't worry if it looks funny. Who cares? The important thing is that if you feel the Lord impressing something on you, respond in faith and obedience, you see? Second, the love of money and the deceitfulness of riches can destroy us and make us unfruitful. And we plainly see that in Laban's life. He was becoming unfruitful because he was attached to the wrong thing. There was this illusion of wealth. And there's a proverb that talks about it, how riches, they, they, they are kind of like an eagle. You see, you, your eye says, oh, there's, there it is. And then as you go to grab it, the thing flies away and it's further away from you. And, and as I interpret that, it's, it's a continual thing. I think I have it now, and I don't. And I think I, well, no. And then just like they said to John Rockefeller, well, how much money, more money do you need? Well, just a little bit more. There's really never an end to it. The third thing is that God sees what you and I are going through, and he will vindicate us if we remain faithful. You can't, you can't miss that. It's, it's kind of short in there, but that's the reality. God sees what you're going through. And, and you know, different seasons of our life, we go through different things. Some things are harder than others. But God sees it. And if we remain faithful, he'll bring us through in a way that is glorifying to him. And then fourth and finally... Sometimes when God moves you forward, he reminds you of the places where you have encountered him before. Genesis 28, Jacob has the dream about the ladder and the angels of God ascending and descending on that ladder. And he slept on a rock using the rock as a pillow. I'd love to see that rock and what it looked like, right? How is that rock comfortable enough to sleep on? But when he awoke, It says, he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And he built an altar there and made a vow, saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So Jacob had that encounter as he was on the way to Haran. And now that he's getting ready to leave, God reminds him of that encounter. And the vows that he made. And how God blessed him and spoke to him very clearly in that occasion. And perhaps I believe for us it's appropriate to remind ourselves of the place or places we have been where we've encountered the Lord in our journey as we, we can make a fresh commitment to him and we can see him doing some new things. I can think of a, 
individual who was retiring from ministry. Uh, his wife taught here for about 20 years, uh, Jeff Long, if any of you know him. He was at Farmington United Methodist. I think it's on 322-ish out there in, in Farmington, pastor there for about 20 years. And as he was retiring, uh, a few years beforehand, they, 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 the denomination says, you can take time and we will help you pay for it to go back to the places in your life where God was at work. And, and he essentially went back to his childhood town. He went back to, uh, somehow he was connected with Australia. He went to Australia. They paid him to go to Australia and, and have Beth come along with him. Isn't that cool? And they were there for a while in other places. And they were able to look at what God had done. And then really he was able to serve the last five years in trying to bring others into ministry to replace him. But it was a very significant thing. So it's important that we go through times where we we remind ourselves of what the Lord has done in our past. And that's a blessing. In fact, the worship team is going to be coming forward. I want to invite them. And uh, as we present ourselves to the Lord, they have a song that's going to be to, to that end of reminding ourselves of God's faithfulness and what he has done in our past. Can we just present ourselves afresh to the Lord this morning? Let's just look to the Lord. Father, right now in this place, we make an altar. At this altar, we give you thanks for who you are and for how you've led us along the way, for your abundant provision and for your blessings, blessings that we perhaps didn't even deserve, but you have blessed us, and we acknowledge you as the source of blessing in our lives. Father, I pray that you will help us to place you first in everything, and to be faithful to obey you completely as we look to honor you and your word. Lord, today we saw two snares to avoid in this message. First, the practice of divination or anything that would cause us to find your will through illegitimate means. If we have practiced that in our past, we repent of it right now and ask you to forgive us. Thank you that you forgive us when we repent. Keep us, I pray, on the narrow path as we take the road that pleases you. Similarly, Lord, we've learned that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And it will destroy us and make us unfruitful. And it could even destroy family relationships if we let it. Father, if we have succumbed to this temptation, today, right now, we repent and we ask your forgiveness. Forgive us for not placing you first and trusting you. Perhaps that's part of why you reminded Jacob of his commitment to you in the first place. Even in his finances, that saying, of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Forgive us if we have withheld our hearts from you and put money first rather than putting you first and seeing you as our source. Thank you that even as Jesus said, we cannot serve God and riches. So we thank you that you are faithful to help us change from the inside out. And Lord, we thank you that you're faithful to lead us forward, to lead us forward, to move us at different points in our life. And you even will cause us to reflect on times where we have encountered you before. Bring us to those places, Lord. And we thank you that regardless of our path, you have seen all our affliction and your heart is to vindicate the faithful. Help us to remain faithful to you and to the work before us in Jesus' name. Friend, if you don't know Jesus, I want to encourage you and even challenge you to put your faith and trust in him. Everything else in this life will fail. It's like shifting sand. You can rest your whole life and your whole belief system on things only to be older. It's like they, they, they say, I, I, I worked my whole life to climb the ladder of success. And then I got to the top of the building and I said, this is the wrong building. If your trust is in money or your 401k or any such, it's shifting sand. But Jesus Christ, the son of God, the holy God who made you and the world and everything in it. You will not be shaken if your trust is in him. He is greater than bedrock. 
building your life upon bedrock. He is unchanging. And I just want to encourage you to put your faith and trust in him. If you've never done that before, just simply pray this with me. Just say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. Right now, I make you Lord of my life. I take myself out of the driver's seat, figuratively speaking, and give you control of my life. Help me to be a good passenger who trusts in you at every turn along the way and resists the temptation to grab the wheel when I don't think you're doing what I want you to do. Give me faith to follow you and to obey in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, the worship team's got a song for us. Perhaps you can stand or however they want to instruct you. And we'll uh, close with that song before Pastor Josh comes up. Yeah, if you guys would stand. Mm-hmm.